mailbag time. I've got loads here. Let's get stuck into it. Oh, I'm not quite sure what's in here yet. As always, there'll be links down below if I can give you links. Let's see what we've got here. Yeah, it's a nickel strip. Or oh, probably nickel plated something or other. I don't know. <laughs> it could be steel. But yeah, it's nickel plated strip. This is for doing like battery terminals for doing spot welding. I didn't have a spot welder yet. But I ordered some of that because I knew I'd probably need some at some point. RAM. Four sticks of RAM. It's pure, you know, fairly well protected. It should be okay. It's pretty rigid cardboard. Dad would have bent. So this is RAM from my Mac Pro. It's got um, 64 gigabytes of RAM in there already, but it's the 1600 megahertz speed. This is 1866, which gives me a, approximately a 10% speed improvement. Okay, connectors and cables, pre-made JSTs. There's different types of JST connectors, like different name conventions depending on the pin spacings. And these are an assortment of different pin configurations. You know, or pin numbering, right? So there's different numbers of pins. And I think I, I think these are two millimeters. Look at the link down below if you want to find out. But these aren't the 0.1 inch spacing which is really common these are smaller no can you guess from that it's about that big that's how big it is can you measure that on screen how about if i get closer no. yeah anyway <laughs> so yeah so i've got two right through to ten i think it is something like that because i didn't have any of this size i've got the 0.1 inch size you know the 2.54 millimeter type i've got loads of those but i didn't have any of this size and i needed this size for a project i was working on Yeah, okay, cool. Hope for these are the right things. Let's find out. Now these are needed for a bit of a weird situation. I've got a piece of test gear here, which I've done videos about. You probably would have seen it by the time you see this video. And it's a capacitance standard, like a decade capacitance thing, right? But it's got these sockets along the front, and they're not four millimeters. They're 5.5. And they're actually shorting plugs, so when you plug something into them, it shorts the, the terminals inside and then adds that capacitance to the output of the unit. And I had no plugs for it. And I think these will fit. Let me go and try it. So yes, these do fit. These plug in beautifully. The only problem is the actual sockets are quite recessed, so when I push this in, it disappears below the faceplate and I have to use tweezers to get it back out. So I need to do something with that, but the actual physical connection is good, so that's the main thing. I need to find some way of attaching to the back of this. Maybe I'll stick up like a bit of wire or something on the back of it or something, I'm sure. Solder a piece of wire onto the back of them. So I can actually then use them as plugs. Yeah, it's just a weird size, but this place has got loads of these things. I mean, like, you've got the standard like four millimeter blunder plugs, right? And they have five, 5.5, six, eight, I think. Um, all these different sizes. So if you've got a socket, which is a weird size, definitely follow the link down below for these, because it's the first time I've come across this situation. And I was actually pleased to find a method of solving that problem. Yeah, I've got 10 of those. I'm not sure it's enough now. I'm thinking maybe I should have got more. Ooh, it's a bag inside a bag. Why? And it's a bag inside a bag inside a bag. <laughs> uh, okay, right. These are some I've shown previously, but different. Battery terminals. So these are AA battery terminals. Now, the ones I've shown before are AAA battery terminals. These are AA battery terminals. So I've got these when I'm doing repairs to equipment, and I may need to replace the existing terminals. And uh, I didn't actually have any suitable replacements. Now I've got some. That is all that type. What's this type? These are the individual ones as well. So I've got the dual type, and I've got the singles as well which are tangled up, there we go, and a single type as well, like that. Just in case I need those ones. They don't seem to be very well centred, but uh, they probably won't really matter, to be honest. Yeah, I don't know, we'll see. But at least now I've got the terminals, so if I do get a situation where I need to replace them, I've got something. Brilliant. 
Also, thanks a lot to my Patreons and my YouTube members that support the channel. They help me to buy things in my bag and piece of test equipment effects. So if you're interested in helping to support the channel, please check out the links down below to Patreon or at the end of the video, there's also a link there. And it helps to ensure that I can create more content for you. Ah, brilliant. Excellent. It's a little lithium cell. I was worried that this would never make it here, but it did make it here. So it's a 500 milliamp hours. It's a bit smaller than I wanted. I think I wanted like an 800 or ideally, but this will do. It will fit and it will do the job. Now I've got a dash cam which has got a dead battery in it. I'm doing a video about it actually. I've already done a bunch of footage, taking it apart and figuring out what's wrong with it. And the battery was basically completely dead. So I need to put your battery in it. So I'm doing a video about that. So watch out for that video too. And now I've got this battery, I can finish it off. So I showed these before in a previous mail bag and I used them. So I've got some more. Because the amount of times I've actually needed to have batteries like this in repairs and projects I've been doing, I just like to have them on hand. So next time I come across a situation where I need to put some of these batteries in, then I've got them there. So these are some nickel bit hydride, three and a half amp hours, 7.2 volt pack. So six cells in there. All right, and a pair of them. So I actually used a pair of these recently in the project and to create 14.4 volts. And it worked beautifully. So I've got some more. Now I've got even more spares. I like to have spares. You know this. If you watch my channel for a while, then you know I like to have spares and redundancy. And you always need spares. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> There's another battery. Also 500 milliamp hours. This is a different style, different size. This one's got the plug on it. So the first one I showed is this one. You see you've got 60, 20, 40, and this is 60, 25, 35. Different dimensions. It's a case of seeing which one will fit best in the unit. Now, I actually have two dash cams which are exactly the same. The other one hasn't died yet. I'm thinking, well, if one is gone, the other one could be soon as well, because they're the same age. And this one's got the plug on it, which may actually be suitable for what I want anyway. I may be able to just plug this straight in or maybe adapt it or something. Take the pins out and put them to the other plug or something because it does plug in the original one. With this one here I'm going to have to like solder the wires on to the existing wiring. But this one doesn't have the thermocouple. There's a thermistor connection. This one's got the thermistor connection. So I think this was the preference. So this one here was the one I was going to have my preference to put in there because it has the thermistor connection which is the white one there. Well, this one doesn't have that. Without that I'd have to like add one on or something. So uh, this is the better one to use, if I can use that. But I've got both, just in case I couldn't get either one to work or something. <laughs> That's a lot. Okay, yeah. This is silicon grease, apparently. Can you read that? 300 grams. I think I've got to be carried away, because I bought some of this one as well at the same time. And I wasn't quite sure what I was going to end up getting. So I've got this one as well, which is different specs. Um, unfortunately, I don't know what that, any of that says, but the um, top has been dented. It's got a seal in there still, which is not actually sealing because it's peeled off. There you go. That's really, really fluid, that one. That's not so greasy. It's more of oily. Anyway, I'm sure it's got a use. I'll put this back on again before I make a huge mess. The fact that the lid is a bit rubbish means it's probably not going to seal anyway. Best not tip it on its side. Aha! Spot welder. I bought this myself. I didn't get sponsored. I sh probably should have actually. Probably should have asked about getting sponsored. Yeah, I saw Julian Eilert had one of these. I think his was sponsored though. And he's just quite happy with it. And I saw that. It seemed to work well for him. I've been thinking about getting a spot welder for a while. And I did actually try and buy one once, but for some reason the sale just never happened. I don't know. It just never turned up. So, I got another one. Well, I got one. The funny thing is, this also is the second one. So, I purchased one. It got sent back. It got halfway here and got returned to sender. And so, I had to get another one. Leads and stuff in the bottom there. Also comes with some nickel strip as well. And it's got these 
This is the same as Julian's one with the screwing tips. So cool. So I've got a spot welder now. There's been a few times I wish I had one. Now I've got one. English. All these settings in here. You can change all the various pulse times and stuff like that. I don't know, I have to figure out how to use it. But um, Julian did actually covered it quite well. Julian did a quite in-depth thorough video on his one. I quite liked what he had, which is why I decided to get one as well. It looked like it was a decent unit, so I decided to get the same one. It's not like I've got a big use for it. There have been plenty of times when I've wanted to have a spot welder, and now I've got one. Seven inch LCD display. Run out two four by six hundred. Got some cables and stuff there. Driver disc. There is the display. There it is. Let's just see if I can make use of this. So this is intended for the Raspberry Pi because it's got touch on it as well. It's a touch screen. I showed a 5 inch touch screen before, but and it did kind of work, but not for the application I was trying to use. It wasn't fully compatible. I had problems with it being weird. So I got a different one. This one's from Amazon. So we'll see if this one works and does the job. Mounting it's going to be tricky though. It's not quite this. It needs like a bezel and stuff for it really, but I have to probably 3D print something. That's not a problem. But uh, we'll see how it goes later on. I might do a project on that and show you if, if it's successful, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I've got an idea, but um, we'll see. Another big box. I think I know what's in this one. This is PB Tech. Yep, usual thing. Packaging shoved on top. That's fine. It's just a Netgear switch. It's the uh, GS108. Got one of these already, and I use it in the motorhome for the networking in there. And um, it's been faultless, had not had a problem with it at all, it's been rock solid, much better than the previous switch I had in there. I'd like to have spares for everything, as you know, you always need a backup, and I didn't have a backup one of these, so I got a spare one. They're actually on special at the time, so I got a bit cheaper than the last one, which is quite good, but this can sit on the shelf for the time when I actually need to replace it. I may never need to replace it, but when it does blow, if I quite know, do you, um, I will have a spare. Oh, uh, okay. Right, I know what this is. This is something for me to have a play around with and then send back. It needs modifying. The power adapter. So, you've probably seen me do lots of these videos on farm tech equipment. And this is a different version. This is an early one. No power switch there. That's interesting. This is an early one. So all the ones of these I've shown previously, which I've worked on before, they've all had the internal batteries on them. This one does not have an internal battery, this one uses a power supply. Which isn't so good when you're in the middle of a paddock. Uh, so I've been asked to see if I can actually modify this to have it battery operated. Whether it can have a different casing put on it or whatever or whatever. I don't know, I've never even seen one of these versions. I knew they existed but I've never seen one before. So I've got to take this thing apart and have a look at it and see what I can do. So that may or may not be a project which will feature a video about, I don't know yet. Bonus footage from our bag. This just arrived. Let's have a look. You can blame Ian Scott Johnson for this. He did something similar recently and it made me think that actually I should be doing the same. It's particularly FW4B version. So this one should have 8GB of RAM and 120GB of SSD. It says it does on the front, so hopefully it does actually have that. Quick start guide, awesome. There's the unit. And we've got a bunch of packaging stuff in here. We've got power supplies, cables, rear can plug of course. Don't care about it, it's just IEC, doesn't matter. We've got a Ethernet to serial adapter, interesting. Power supply. What's the output on that thing? 12 volts, 3.3 amps. Got a mounting bracket, in case you want to mount it to the back of a monitor or something like that. A visa mount. Okay, well, put these bits away, don't interest in those right now. 
Let's take a look at the box. So this is it here. There's the rear. It's got four LAN ports on the back. Well, three LAN, one WAN. DC input there, some indicators. This is the front or the back because it's got indicators. I don't know. Is that the front or the back? Because you've got a power switch. Which one's the front? Hmm. Anyway, it's got HDMI's. Another COM port here, which is used for communication and some USBs for connecting up a keyboard and mouse and stuff like that. It's got a headphone jack. I'm not quite sure why you did that. Basically, this is a mini PC in a way, but it's a firewall. So you can put something like PFSense on it or OpenSense or something similar to that and run it as a firewall. And you basically put this in between your network, you know, your WAN interface and your network. So you put that into your WAN, like your modem, and these will go to your network. You also have individual networks, so if you want to isolate them, you can do that by having physical isolation between each one as well. So you've got, you know, like, say, a security camera system, you can put that on this one. You put your computer on this one, for example. We can have your printers or any IoT devices on this one, for example. This is an example. So you can have isolation between the networks. But to increase security, so if one thing gets hacked, it can't get through your entire network or well, at least reduces the chances of it happening. Ian Johnson got one of these or something very similar to this recently and he was talking about using PFSense on his one and you may think that actually, yeah, I really should be running a firewall. I've been a bit negligent really. I really should be setting one up. And this was $500 in Zealand for this thing. Basically a mini PC in a way. But if I'd got like a PFSense box, like the, is it Net something? NetGuard or NetSafe is it? I can't remember what they call it now. They got one of those, like, they're more expensive by probably $200 or so for the base models and obviously getting more expensive than that. So this is the cheaper option of doing it this way with the Protecti box and uh, so you can run OpenSense or PFSense. I think you can do VLANs and stuff like that as well. I've got no experience with VLANs so I don't know if I'll do that. I don't have a managed switch so I can't really do isolation through a managed switch either and that would be a way to go if I wanted to add more protection change the switches out to manage switches and then have those allocated to do the job. I've got to figure out how to use this thing here. I've got to do a lot of work on this thing. But it's supposed to have RAM and SSD. Let's open it up and have a look inside, see what's inside it. So obviously your basic modem you get from your ISPs usually have some kind of firewall into it. And you may be running a firewall on a computer to help protect your computer. It doesn't protect your entire network, which is a good idea to do. And I was, I'm surprised I never thought about doing this before. I really should have done. That's how it screws out. 128 gig SSD. And you've got some RAM in there, which hopefully is 8 gig. It's got a little battery on the lead there, so if you want to replace the battery, you can do that. So at least it looks like it's configured correctly. It has RAM, so it's probably right. But there's a lot going on in here. Really crammed in there. So there's a nice project to keep you going for the weekend, I think. Get this thing configured. Now my network is quite complicated, so I'm probably going to spend a lot of time trying to set up rules and things like that for the firewalling. Uh, I think the actual installation of OpenSense or PFSense is easy. OpenSense is what I'm leaning towards. It seems to be a better option in some ways. Unless this has already got something installed. I don't know if you've seen pre-installed it. Maybe. I, I doubt it, but it could be. You never know. But if it's blank, then I'll be chucking OpenSense on it. And that process looks relatively straightforward. I've seen some videos online, so it makes me an expert, doesn't it? Actually, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, um, so I'll, I'll be playing with that, getting it set up, and then I'll try and set up all the rules and figure out that stuff, because by default you want to block everything and only allow the stuff you want to pass through. So I do have remote access to my security cameras, so I can remotely view them and things like that. So that is something I need to pass through, and I also have my NAS, which also remotely access, so I need to pass that through. And there's also things like that, but I'm using non-standard ports and those things to make sure that it's a bit more secure, at least rather than default ports, so it helps slightly, but um, I'll probably do something like check the IP address ranges things like that because I know what IP addresses these will be getting access from externally maybe some way of doing that I'm not quite sure but something is going to be better than absolutely nothing which is what I've currently got apart from what's built into the modem which probably isn't wonderful very basic firewalling um, at least this can configure it as required so I need to load this quick start guide up and go and have a read so click subscribe right now quick before you forget there's a subscribe link right there if you want to subscribe to the channel this video is down there to watch as well, below in the video and in the description. Don't forget all the links in the description for various items here which I've featured, which you can potentially go and buy yourself or something similar to it. And there's a Patreon support link right there if you want to help support the channel and help me to buy more things and help me to repair bits of test equipment from eBay. Get you later.